As far as I know at the time, it's the last massive army that's within easy reach of me. At the time. Yeah. Yeah. Spoilers, it's not the last massive army within easy reach of me. It's most definitely not. But we'll get to that later. So right now, our men are going through a little bit of a meat grinder. I would have preferred to get uh, less casualties. Let's face it, of course I would have preferred to get less casualties. But right now, this little pocket of resistance is very, very, very bad for me because it's actually holding. It's actually holding against me. It's very irritating. Luckily, our cavalry is up front, so they're able to kill off a lot of the routing enemy. I was lucky in that I managed to break at least one unit. I'm not exactly sure because I didn't see it precisely myself, but I'm pretty sure that we broke two or three units at the same time just after we killed the general. So I'm assuming that some of them were already wavering, or at least shaken, and when we hit the general and killed him, that translated into a rout. And in the Total War games, routing enemies, multiple enemies at a time, is very, very, very important. It was important in real life too, because, you know, if one unit breaks, you might be able to plug the line. But if three or four of them break at the same time, and they open a massive hole in your line, good luck. Good luck trying to plug that one. So, same principle applies in Rome Total War, and Rome Total Realism, and Medieval 2 Total War, and basically all the Total Wars. If you can break enough units, at the same time, you can generally push the entire army out. This even works on very hard, and considering that this is basically very hard, because of the extra morale buffs, and the damage buffs, and the defense buffs that the Rome Total Realism team gave all these units, it's definitely possible to break an army all at once at the same time, but occasionally, if they've got very elite units, you'll end up with pockets of resistance like this. So those two Chakaspildi units, Chakaspildis, I don't know, they're being morale boosted by the Argaspides, Argaspides, those guys, the Silver Shields, I'm just going to call them Silver Shields for now. Uh, they're basically the Triarii. They're actually, in real life history, they were the bodyguards for the Seleucid Kings, or they were part of the bodyguard. I think they're actually the junior version of the bodyguard, and that there's a second, more elite version. But basically, those guys are the Triarii, and they're acting like a banner for the enemy to rally around. Luckily, we managed to break most of the flank that was off to their right, but this pocket of resistance is very, very, very hard to break. I was lucky in that when we finally got the general up here, charging one of the units was enough to break all of them. Could have easily not been, but we were able to, obviously, scare them enough with numbers. And I'm trying to decide which way to go. I decide on that fellow in the end because I think to myself, well, if those silver shields hold long enough, the they're going to really, praised. really make it an issue for us. Fear, so basically, flee. everybody charge, and our Sarmatian reinforcements charge in too. And it's pretty much over, except for the little wrapping up of everybody. But that could have easily been disastrous, and I'd imagine if I'd attacked with Drusus instead, because Drusus had no real veteran troops, we would have been in a very, very, very bad spot. Because I'm convinced that the fact that some of our troops are silver chevron and three bronze chevron, etc., was what made it possible for them to hold out long enough. Because morale is very, very important in these games. As you've seen, most of the battles that we've won by a crushing landslide victory have been where we were able to... have been where we were able to uh, push the enemy out. Sorry about that, my, uh, my computer just decided no, I didn't really want to uh, continue having a screen to watch. <laughs> so uh, yeah, we were able to push most of them out of the, uh, of the area that we were having to fight them in, and by creating that one defensive pocket they were able to hold us up for a little while, but inevitably we were going to break through. 
But it's morale problems like that, where there will be one or two very, very stubborn units that hold you up, that can occasionally make battles in Rome Total Realism complete clusterfucks. It has happened before, it has happened before, but we were able to crush the army completely. It routed entirely because we killed the general, thank god. And right now I'm trying to decide where exactly I want to send Sabinus. I thought about sending him off to Eusebases? Eusebases? I think that's what it's called. That city off to the uh, the right with all of the troops in it. Eusebases. We'll call it Eusebases. If I'm wrong, I'll put an annotation. And uh, I planned originally to send him there, but I decided in the end that perhaps that bridge might be a better spot. Just in case there's armies lurking out in the darkness that I can't quite see that can get to me. It's not entirely required, but it is, you know, it's, it's a good idea to try and put your armies into a defensive position in case they're attacked because you don't want to have to fight the enemy in a battlefield that doesn't serve some kind of advantage. That's basic military tactics, that's basic military sense. Sun Tzu said it, and if Sun Tzu said it almost 2,000 years ago, or more than 2,000 years ago rather, he probably knew what he was on about. Alright, so we push that guy back and Drusus is going to go in there and fuck him up. Alright. So the army that we're attacking with is kind of bad for what we're trying to do, really. It's it's not very good at all. It's a very, very bad uh, army to be attacking with because it hasn't got very much infantry. And we're facing off against Understand phalanxes. This. The shitty phalanxes, this but the phalanxes. So we do our usual setup, except we haven't got any Thracians this time, so the army feels incomplete. But uh, we do have some Galatians still, which is nice. So the Galatians sit off on our right, and we've got a ton of archers and such, which is very, very useful when it comes down to fighting. But it could have been... yeah, it, I would have swapped three of those units, at least, for three units of proper Roman infantry. That would have made my job a lot easier. So I decide that what we're going to do is we're going to put all the archers and such behind the Romans and we'll put the Italian skirmishers behind the Galatians. It's actually a fairly solid tactic and I'm not quite sure I haven't done it before because placing skirmishers right behind the actual line of battle is kind of, well, very good actually if you can get them close enough and turn skirmish mode off and have them fire over the heads of your guys instead of throwing and accidentally killing some of them it can be very very deadly to the enemy because they'll get hit with a lot of javelins head on just before they're about to hit and charge your forces so it's it's definitely a thought i'm not really entirely sure why it didn't occur to me before because it's kind of a basic military tactic well Skirmish lines are more for out front in front of your uh, main line of battle, but there's no reason it can't work the other way too. Put them behind instead and save their fire for the last second. I would have loved if in just one of the Rome Total Wars, or any Total War really, you could have the option to get your troops to lie down or crouch behind a hill or something like that. Sort of like what the uh, Duke of Wellington did at Waterloo, and was famous for doing actually, where he would pick a slope, a reverse slope, and have his men on the reverse side of it, so when the artillery was firing at them it couldn't really hit them, and if it did hit them it caused very minimal casualties, but it reserved the advantage of surprise as well, because it's one thing to know your enemy is over that hill, it's another thing entirely to see him suddenly stand up and go, hello, before shooting you in the face with a musket or, you know, a bow and arrow or crossbow or whatever it is that he happens to have. It's a very interesting uh, concept, I'd say, of morale because, you know, <laughs> that would be fairly shocking, having some guy just suddenly pop up in front of you. And it would have been nice to see that modelled in one of the... Total War games, especially in Empire or Napoleon, because that would have been the one where it would make the most sense. It would still be cool 
though, like in any of them, because in that case you could have a unit of archers or whatnot if you're playing a game where you don't have all of your army armed with muskets or you know, rifles, etc. It would be nice to be able to order them to lie down because then you could prevent the sort of friendly fire casualties that we've been suffering sometimes with our archers firing over the heads of our guys, but because of the position on the slope of the enemy, they don't quite make it. Which is irritating, to say the least. So our cavalry's proving why skirmishes need cavalry support, and why the Seleucids are kind of stupid. They do actually have fairly decent cavalry, but we haven't seen any of it yet, and I don't believe we will see any of it for a while. At least I'm pretty sure we haven't seen any of it yet. They've got uh, companion cavalry, essentially because they are, of course, a successor to Alexander's Macedonian Empire. And uh, Seleucius, I think his name was, was the general who took command of the area that became the Seleucid Empire. I think it was Seleucus. Anyway, Seleucid come, the Seleucid Empire's name comes from his name, so it's Seleucus or Seleucus, something like that. Something along those lines. But uh, they do actually have access to heavy cavalry, like the Egyptians have access to heavy cavalry, but also like the Egyptians, another successor state, they prefer to use their missile cavalry, which is, well, a bad idea. It's a good idea if your enemy doesn't have any heavy cavalry and actually gives a damn about chasing down your missile cav, but generally I'm willing to let the missile cav go because they'll charge you in the end. You just have to wait, or you have to be clever enough to trick them into getting themselves caught on some infantry or getting themselves caught on some cavalry and then killing them. Kill them all. So we're whittling down the skirmish line because regardless of how much damage our cavalry can do, our archers are the ones that are basically going to be shooting these guys and killing most of them because, well, the cavalry can get close but if they get too close the phalanxes will charge them and also, if they get too close, that missile cav suddenly becomes not just a mild annoyance, but an actual threat. As we'll see soon enough, I believe. I think I try charging at the missile cav with our cavalry. I'm waiting for them to rest. Yeah, yeah, I'm waiting for them to rest at the moment, and basically it doesn't turn out very well. Yep, there they go. Charge of the Light Brigade style. Except at least this time we're not charging into a... Uh, massed Russian cannons that that would have been that would have been an interesting episode of Rome Total Realism if that happened suddenly Russian cannons what's a Russian cannon doing here all right so I attempt to charge I figure we're close enough we can probably make it no they're fresh we're warmed up they can outrun us plus there's a distance between us already I try for about 30 seconds and then I go no nah, it's not gonna work so run away we still suffer some casualties on the retreat, and frankly, that was kind of stupid of me. I shouldn't have done that. I should have waited because, as I said, you can usually catch missile cavalry trying to attack you in a last-ditch assault or as they pass by you in an attempt to get to one of your expendable units that you hung out on the flank. But here we go. The skirmishers are going to do some very, very good work. They're getting fired upon by the archers as well and some peeler from the Romans. And there's a massive volley. I don't know if you can tell the difference between the arrows and the javelins, but it's coming from the front, and that is a massive, massive volley. They're shaking, and they're rushing. That lasted about three seconds. Maybe a little bit less. Now, our Galatians did take some friendly fire, so ideally, in a perfect world, if you were doing that, you would be making sure that your soldiers weren't going to get shot by your own guys, so you'd cease fire about a volley before the uh, contact came between the two infantry forces. Unfortunately, Rome Total War isn't... well, it's an old game. It's good. It's very, very, very good. But it's limited by when it was made. So, while we might be able to do something similar to what I just suggested on uh, modern game design, it's not something that could have been possible with the game design of the time of Rome Total War. Which is unfortunate, because it would have been awesome. It would have been awesome to have that sort of very fine, very tactical control. I mean, you still have it to an extent, but units are slow to respond to orders, 
<laughs> We've all seen the wall debacles in these episodes. It's good, but it's not perfect. It's not perfect. But it is definitely what um, I'd always wished Age of Empires was. Where you'd have your base building, but you'd have your tactical combat as well. And while there's no there's not really base building in this, it's more empire building. It's the same sort of mindset as Age of Empires was. It was it was tactical empire building. But in Age of Empires, obviously, you only had a single base because you were playing on a uh, on a single map. But this is the logical extension of that, I figure, because it's well, same sort of thing. Basically, you're playing as an ancient power, trying to expand your influence, which is what Age of Empires was to a certain extent. Though you played uh, historical scenarios more often than not in that game. This one's sort of about being ahistorical, much like Paradox games are. Once you take control, you change the destiny of whatever it is that you took control of. Whereas Age of Empires was more of a, well, this stuff historically happened, or we have vague evidence of it having happened. How about you play it? But it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Back in the day. Alright, so that cavalry is coming out, and I believe that they're going to try and skewer my cavalry. Well, they might have been going for the Galatians, but I charge with the Galatians, and then I charge with our cavalry as well, and luckily our general cav is quick enough to catch one of them. Just one, but one is enough. And they all turn back around and decide, hang on, we actually all want in on this fight, when before they were going, nope, 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 nope. Now, unfortunately for them, heavy cavalry versus light missile cavalry hmm it doesn't end well it never does it never does though it does help that we outnumbered them and <laughs> we got the charge but still there they go and our general decides that he actually wants to impale himself on a phalanx's many pointed ends but i convince him it's generally a bad idea because let's face it death by being poked it's not something to write home about not something right home about at all. Alrighty, there we go. So, what I want to do essentially is fight these phalanxes one at a time, but I have kind of left myself a little bit crippled in the manner that I've got to fight them because I don't have much infantry. And this is the most lamentable bit of this entire battle because I don't have enough infantry to pin down both phalanxes at once. I could try, I could definitely try, but then it wouldn't really be all that effective because I could only pin down one at a time, obviously, as I just mentioned. But luckily we do have some peeler and we do still have some um, javelins for the Italian skirmishers. So we're able to get a few good hits in. And Right this second, I decide, you know what, let's try and get them as close behind as we possibly can so we can throw Pillar at them at point-blank range. I'm hoping that what we can do is we'll break this one unit and then we'll be able to move Swarm on to the next one. It sort of works. You'll see. So we are within range. And we are getting our shots off. And they are trying to decide which way they want to go. So all of those things are good. All of those things are indeed happening. What's not happening is a break. Because unfortunately, these are not Persian Phalanx Spearmen. Or Persian Phalanx Pikemen, I think they are in this game. Unfortunately, they are not them. So they don't really want to break quite as I was hoping they would. They're interested, they're definitely interested, they're hoping to, but they're not interested enough to actually go do. So I'm moving everybody up because basically we're going to need everyone for this fight. There is no way we could face off against these two units with only half our army. That, that would never work. Because, again, not enough infantry.
So those guys are wavering. I do charge with the cavalry because I figure, well, hell with it. Why not? Maybe it'll be enough. They do get to shaken, but they don't quite run, unfortunately. They're not in a running mood. Not yet. There we go. So, one unit has decided that it would like to run, and I hope, at this point, that I'm able to charge and break the other unit, because we've broken one of them, charge the other one, break it. Unfortunately, they have the general, so they're not entirely pleased about this whole, you know, let's run away idea. They're not really into it, and unfortunately, our units kind of got all muddled up in the pursuit because they were chasing the other unit instead of attacking as I'd order them to. That is another problem with Rome Total War in particular, is that you would order your troops to attack a certain unit, but instead of attacking that certain unit, they decide, you know what, let's just attack the closest guy to us, because that makes sense. And I'll admit, to a certain extent, it does make sense. You know, you, you get an order, charge, so you charge at the closest thing. But if you get a specific order, if you get told specifically to charge that unit three units from the right, surely you would charge the unit three units to the right. I don't know. I don't know. It's not enough of a game breaker to turn me off playing the game. I still play Rome to War a lot because it's one of the most fun games in the series. Unlike Rome 2, that is a whole nother conversation. Uh, but it, it is a fun game. It's just a little derpy. <laughs> it's just got a few little niggling problems. But all in all, it's a good game, and it's definitely, you know, considering its age, it's, it's aged very well. Very, very well indeed. So our skirmishes go in. Now, another thing that happens sometimes is units fragment, and you can see those couple of guys moving back towards my cavalry. Those guys from the uh, Chaka Speedies unit, Ch Chaka Speedies, those guys, They've just broken off doing their own thing. Units will do that. Sometimes you order them to attack and they're so spread out that they're just like, it looks like they're looking for something that someone dropped. They're not really interested in fighting, they're, they're looking for Tony's wallet because Tony dropped something and god damn it, Tony's gonna get it back. But they're wavering. Wavering. They should break any second now. Come on, guys. You know you want to. Once more like you mean it. There we go. Now they're broken and fighting to the death. So, as Sun Tzu once said, very famously, make sure that you don't you know, cut off your enemy's only line of retreat. Always leave them way out, otherwise they will fight to the death. So we do. And there we go, we can continue the battle, and kill them all. General's dead, and they are all being murdered. Hooray. Yes, yes, heroic victory, worthy of Roman arms. So, not the greatest victory in the world, nope, just a tribute, but it was pretty good, it was nothing to sneeze at. Not half bad. Victory! Alrighty, so Drusus has broken the threat that was facing the sieging force at Adana, or at least most of it. There's still a couple of roaming armies going around, but we can only do so much. And now we grab Skavola Senior, and we're gonna give him a couple of units to take over. So we give him these Hoplites and the Hastati, because those units are actually full strength. I didn't realize that I still had some over in Greece, but I did, and we've got a lot of uh, mercenaries to back them up. So we grab all of the hoplites and the Cretan archers and move to the port, and luckily for us there's some Rhodians, some Thracians, and another set of Cretan archers. So we load all of those guys up onto the boats, and hopefully next turn, at time of recording, I was going hopefully, Next turn, we'll be able to send them over to Asia Minor and disembark them, so that they'll be able to free up some of our other troops, or at least make sure that we've got sufficient garrisons in the cities, so if the Seleucids come, we can bog them down by making them attack 
each city individually. Luckily for us, the Seleucids don't actually build ballistas. They don't really build um, portable siege equipment, which is strange because I would have thought that that would be one of the things that the AI would prioritize building. I don't, personally, because I don't like assaulting, so why do I need it if I'm going to wait anyway? But the AI likes to attack, it's kind of what it does, it goes attack, attack, attack. So I was confused as to why it doesn't say, it doesn't seem to build those things, it doesn't seem to build those units that can fire at gates and break them. I have been building a few of them lately because uh, for the legions I want to try them out, I just wanted to see if they would work very well and we haven't actually had a chance to see my experiment in the works but uh, I hope, I hope to see some good results. Scorpions, it seems to me, would make sense that we'd have them, but they slow down the army, so I'm not entirely sure whether I want to keep them. I'm thinking that uh, I'll ditch them in hindsight, because that just occurred to me now that they probably slow down army movement, and considering how vital it is in this game that you keep up your momentum, that might not be the best thing in the world. Alrighty, so I'm trying. I'm still trying to decide where exactly I want to send those Libyan spearmen, because the forces over in Africa kind of don't really need to be replaced. They're all got. They've all got good generals. Or most of them do, at any rate. And the troops there are non-retrainable anyway. So I'm definitely considering sending them over to the east. But I don't move them yet. I want to keep them on standby as sort of a quick response force. And also I want to wait until we've got a few more of them, just so if we want to we can split them up into multiple places. The siege on Palma still goes well. Augustus is still besieging. He's still got all his command sexiness. I'm hoping to get him a couple more units of Iberians, because Iberians are very very good like Thracians. They come with javelins and they're very very tough. So we go around looking for a uh, buildings I believe. I'm trying to find places where I can build Roman citizenships so that we can get more legions because, well, only Roman citizenships can build legions, unlike the provincial barracks being enough to build most pre-Marian troops. Which I always thought was a bit strange about this mod because pre-Marian troops were still citizens. That, that was sort of the point, they were still citizens, but you can build them at a provincial barracks. It's nice though, because otherwise, if you couldn't, you'd be bogged down for so long waiting for uh, waiting for the game to get started. And I understand it's a realism mod, but you can't be 100% realistic in a game, because it's a game. It's not meant to be 100% realistic. If it's 100% realistic, it's probably going to be boring as hell. That's what simulators are for. Though, I will admit, I do like Silent Hunter. Silent Hunter 4, not Silent Hunter 5. Silent Hunter 5 was terrible. But Silent Hunter 4 and uh, I.L. Sturmovic. Those are quite fun. I do like them. Simulators can be good, but a simulator for this sort of game would probably be immensely dull, tedious, and boring. I would be happy to be proved wrong. I would love to see a simulator game for this genre, but it's unlikely. It is unlikely. The closest thing we've probably got is Paradox releasing games like this. Uh, like Crusader Kings 2 and Europa Universalis and Victoria, yes, but mm, even those aren't quite simulators. They're more, uh, they're more sandboxes, I suppose. They're sort of they're semi-simulators, I guess, because they do have economics and all that sort of stuff. I did notice as well on screen. Back to that for a moment. I did notice that there is an Egyptian army embarked upon a ship. I'm hoping that it's not heading to Salamis because if it's heading to Salamis. We could be in a bit of a pickle. I'm hoping that the rebels can defeat it, or if it's not heading to Slamis and it's heading for something like Rhodes, I can intercept it with my own fleet. So now I'm looking around for ports. And I was hoping that Side would have a port, but it does not, so our naval base in Rhodes is only a slight way away from where I actually end up sending our ships, but I decide to redeploy most stuff to a little bit of the east. A little bit to the east of where it once Ready was, because the Mediterranean, or at least the uh, Western Mediterranean, isn't too much of a hotspot. Carthage doesn't have enough power to face us, really. 
but a full stack of Egyptian troops rocking up in the middle of that area of Asia Minor that we've taken, especially with the Seleucids bearing down on us, would be a very, 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 very bad thing. Very bad thing. So I'm contemplating how exactly I could destroy these guys, and I'm just hoping that the uh, the rebels will do it for me. So I didn't attack outside of um, I didn't attack Sinope. So what we're going to have to do is we're going to have to fight the army that came to relieve it. I'm fairly certain we can win at this point of recording. Obviously, you know. At the time where we were at, I was fairly confident we could win. But I decided what I was going to do is I was going to leave you guys on a cliffhanger. So we went back all the way to the screen, and then when I ended the actual video recording, I suddenly realized that I hadn't got any commentary at all. So now you've had about an hour and a half of me, Grey Hunter, in post-commentary goodness. You're welcome. 